James Myrtle, senior managing editor at The Athletic, someone who was down there on the draft floor, in the room, saw Easton Cowan up close and personal. What's up, James? Uh, I got about four hours sleep last night, so oh, and we're, we're, we're it's almost time to go back to the draft. Yeah. So it's it's one of those uh, it's one of those kind of weeks. So, uh, but I'm I'm happy to give you what's left of my brain cells here in uh, uh-huh. on this. On this, this this hit way to temper expectations for the way to sell the show. Oh, <laughs> uh, I will try to. I said to the producer, somebody. I don't know if my voice is even going to last for it's however fine. long you want to make me talk. Don't you know that this whole business is faking it? It's all faking it. It's faking it. Don't do you mean don't pull I back the curtain make, and show the people. I've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm comfortable telling you that this is, <laughs> I, I'm giving you what I've got left here. So why didn't we see any trades last night? Uh, the market's really jammed up, and the other thing too is like a lot of the a lot of like the desperation trades that they already happened, and and they, there's also a bit of a stalemate here because teams that are trying to move money are shocked by how little they can get back for the money they're trying to move. Like look at that Riley Smith trade, like mm-hmm. a good player, Stanley Cup winner, all they get's a third round pick. It's not a bad contract. Like it's, I thought I thought that was a really good move by Pittsburgh. So, or you even look at. Uh, uh, Ross Colton, the Tampa trades him. There's a lot of people here in Nashville are talking about that one. Like, you know, there's there's Kevin Hayes at half his salary. You know, there, there's useful players being just given away because mm-hmm. teams need to get out from the money. So there's a bit of a stalemate here where some of the teams that are trying to move money are like, I don't really want to like, I don't want to trade a useful player for nothing. But it seems like that's the market right now. So it's it feels a little bit like a paradigm shift right now with some of the the deals that are happening. So Sometimes I, I and, and the other thing too is I mean we're going into day two. I bet you like I'll, I'll, the dam's going to break here. I bet you there's going to be all kinds of stuff that happens today. Yeah, uh, that's just the way it's it has to go. Because I'm like, all right, I'm going to prepare for tonight. It's going to be good, and hopefully we end up getting a bit more of a quiet Thursday leading to Friday. Nah, it's going to. I would assume mm-hmm. that yeah, there's going to be a ton that ends up happening today. And so I guess the follow up to that is, how much do you think that impacts? Teams like the Leafs, who were, if they were exploring even the potential for a guy like Marner or a guy like Nylander, do you feel like those guys are excluded from that cap crunch, that money crunch? Or do you think that, yeah, part of, let's just say part of the reason that Toronto might capitulate on deals or want to end up running it back is that, yeah, there's, there's not even really a big market for those guys because the money is too big. Possibly, I haven't I haven't heard that, but it 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 tracks. It makes sense. I mean, this goes back years, but part of the problem with like any time they've ever like contemplated or kicked tires on the Nylander trade is that like a lot of teams just don't value him where he should be. Like he's mm-hmm. a better player than teams think. And but for Nylander's camp, they should think like if we go to free agency, like there might not be as many teams as as we think there's going to be. So and the free agent class of of next year is is a lot better than this year. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's what what teams are saying right now is that the cap being flat again for whatever this is, like the fifth year or something, is just it's really causing a lot of headaches. It's it's really jamming everything up. So it very well could be that the Leafs are looking at free agency and they're looking at the landscape and they're and, and it's tough. And it's interesting that they paid the money on David Kauf that they weren't willing to pay all season when they talked <laughs> about an extension. Um, and I think it's going to be a fascinating next like three, four days for the league and for the Leafs here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to get into the camp stuff, but just because you mentioned Nylander, let's go there now. So Timo Meyer signs that extension, right? Mm -hmm. And pretty much the consensus is, okay, well, if that's what Timo Meyer gets, Mm -hmm. Nylander has to get less. Do you agree? I thought Meyer got less than I thought he was going to get. Of course. And he got less than everyone thought. I thought for sure it started with a nine. Mm -hmm. So nice work by, by the devils. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you look at the comparables. I mean, look at the deal that Matt Kachuk signed last year with Florida. Like, can you really argue that Nylander should get more than that? No. Based on track records and, 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 and I mean, just look at the season that Kachuk had. I don't think so. I think the right n- number for Nylander is under 9.5, uh, even with the cap going up. But no one's talking. I mean, his, no one is saying anything on this. It's a whisper quiet. But reading the tea leaves, I'm pretty sure they're asking for more than that. So there's that's the stalemate right there. Okay. So, they, sorry, they want more than nine five. I believe so. <laughs> but again, but again, like nothing is coming out of the Leafs or his camp. But 
I think if it was under nine five, I feel like they'd be making progress, and everything I'm hearing, they're not. Okay, well, that's this is what I think is pretty interesting about the next domino. Here is we thought the same thing with the Matthews, Nylander, Marner contracts the first time around, right? And this is when they were RFA's, so different story. But it was okay. There was a clear market that was set. And these guys will fall in line with the market. But they ended up sort of doing their own thing, right? Like, even with Nylander at the time, it's funny. The contract ended up being great. Um, it I, was... I saw the, Yeah, I didn't think they were asking for anything completely unreasonable. That I, I don't know what happened with that Nylander negotiation, but it kind of just went... It, it didn't... It shouldn't have went that way, basically. No. It shouldn't have lasted that long and ruined his season. No, it definitely shouldn't have, especially given where it ended up, right? And then you went, oh, okay, this is where it was at. What were you fighting over? A couple hundred grand? Fine. But I do think that it bled into the next contract negotiations with Marner and Matthews because those guys ended up getting everything. And then we went, oh, well, all the rest of the RFAs are going to probably get these deals. And then they didn't, right? Like that, that didn't end up actually being the case for anybody other than, yeah, Connor McDavid, but he's Connor freaking McDavid. And so honestly, JD, my biggest problem with the Marner and the Matthews contracts was the term wasn't yeah. what it needed to be. No, I mean, James, they, tried, I they, they tried to go longer. Like I, I know with Marner, like they had the longer deals on the table. Like they offered him the Tavares contract, the seven years, 11, and mm. they couldn't get it done. But Matthews at five years, I mean, Nuts. the problem with that is that we're up right now. Mm-hmm. The problem is, you know, and it's, they had, they, there, there was a way for them to get those guys signed seven, eight years. And, and, they blew it and and the Leafs are going to pay for that right now. Yeah. But that's what I wonder about these deals is everyone's kind of looking at this and saying from a leaf fan perspective anyways, and from a leaf perspective, I think probably in general, you're going, okay, you guys have been paid. You've made a ton of money. Now it's potentially a time where you want to give a little bit of that back. If you want to stay together as a team, if you want to run this thing back and remain a core, which they've all publicly come out and stated. And, and I think that they mean it. I, I do think Matthews wants to be here. I think Marner wants to be here. And I think Nylander wants to be here. None of those guys want to be traded from Toronto. This isn't a Calgary. This isn't a Winnipeg. Those guys, if they have their drivers would like to be Toronto Maple Leafs. But if we're hearing that William Nylander wants nine, five or over nine, five and that, yeah, he wants to go over Kachuk's salary. Do you think that this has potential to not get done then this off season? Cause if you're him, I, I like to play this out. I would be thinking if he's going to try to, if they're going to try to put him under the Timo Meyer contract number, and he's already been a guy that was willing to walk into a season like, and just not play games. I would assume mm-hmm. that he's the kind of guy that would be willing to walk into a year and say, yeah, I can go in here without a contract. I mean, um, I- I think both guys are willing to do that, but the, the, the team's going to be, have to be the one that says, no, we're not going to, we don't want to do that. Yeah. But the Leafs can't give Nylander nine, five, even with the cap going up. That is just optically. That is a ridiculously difficult look. It's, it's because of the cap, right? Like yeah. I, 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 you talk to like agents and the way they're looking at this is like, well, the cap might be like a hundred million in like four years. So like if we lock in for a seven, eight year deal, like, what are we agreeing to exactly here? Like is now, now everyone, the, the problem the Leafs are running into is that we've been through this flat cap environment when everyone signed the big deal mm-hmm. and didn't know it was going to be a flat cap environment. And now, now everyone thinks the cap's going to go way up again. So, so now, so now uh, agents are negotiating based on the premise that the cap's going to skyrocket here beginning next year, right when Neilander and Matthews are up. Like it's, it's basically the worst possible timing for the Leafs. Yeah, except for, again, they have a, a comparable player in Timo Meyer who just signed an mm-hmm. eight-year extension for mm-hmm. under nine a season. And so, mm-hmm. to me, you look at that and go, all right, New Jersey, uh, fine. Yeah. Is that's a destination Lewis, that people want to play? Lewis I know gross. Nealander's agent was probably throwing things when he saw what that contract was. But, yeah, no, I mean, you're right. But, I mean, they, they could also point to some other comparables. Like, you could take – you know, some of the numbers that were signed last year, the the guys that did sign in the nine five region, and then you prorate it for the cap going up four million mm. every year going forward. And I don't know. I mean the Leafs want to get New Andrew done, but I think they're also there's a world where they can't. So I still think that one can go either way here. Yeah. Okay. So that one could go either way and that doesn't feel great given that we were just talking about with the trade market. And yeah, if you're another team and you're acquiring Nylander and you know that Toronto's moving him because he didn't want to re-sign in the place he wanted to be for around that number, then mm-hmm. what does that mean for you? Like, what kind of back-channeling do you have to get done? Yeah, they're not going to make the deal until they know what the number is and they, exactly. and they like it. And if the number's really high, then, 
how many teams are actually going to like the number, let alone have the cap space to accommodate it. Yeah, no, that's a uh, that's and a worst case. And want to give up good assets to 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 get the player as well. Yeah, but James, this is why all along. Okay, I used to think that the whole theory about where the guys fell in terms of the order of the contracts was overstated, right? When it was Nylander got paid first, and then it was the other guys. I went, all right, I guess that that does make sense. But there are a phase, and they're younger guys, and yeah, I don't know. It didn't it didn't feel as as much of a modern day problem as it did something from just like an, a little bit of an era before, right? Someone sets the cap standard in free agency and the other guys that want to slot in, all go, well, we have to take less than this guy. And I thought, well, Matthews, and maybe it didn't really work out with Marner because he ends up taking so much that Marner ended up getting more because he did compare himself to Matthews. But mm-hmm. this time around, I, I kind of feel from a cultural standpoint that Matthews does have to sign first and he does have to sign something, even if it is the four-year or the five-year contract, right? Shorter again, fine, whatever. It's got to be something that is somewhat team-friendly. Like the Nathan McKinnon contract, that percentage, I've said it all along. He, to me, he can't go over that percentage. Nathan McKinnon's mm-hmm. won a Stanley Cup. He's going to. Yeah, okay, he's well, so that's I mean. your read on this now, is that he's still looking for the short term, but also he's looking to break the bank and go over that percentage. I mean, again... Uh, We'll see, but it sounds like there's a little bit more willingness on the term side, but we'll see. I, I think the Matthews one is much closer to getting done. Mm-hmm. It, 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 your view of what the, the team-friendly number is is probably a little bit rosier than where it goes, but you know, I know the Matthews camp is happy with Tree Living, and they're happy. They, you know, so well, I'd be happy with Tree Living, too, if he told me you can go over the McKinnon money and don't worry about the term either. Well, I mean, I think if the Leafs can get Matthews for five or six years, they should be pretty happy with it. And you just you try and keep the number as reasonable as you can. But again, the thinking from and not just Matthews agent, but everybody's agent, the thinking is, where is this cap going to be in three or four years? Is it going to be ninety seven, one hundred million? Because it could be. Yeah, it could could be. be. Yeah, it could be. Great. You already did this game. You already did the could be game and God forbid another pandemic ends up happening, but yeah, like, <laughs> hey, like don't you, you talk about things you shouldn't say before I came on. Like, let's just say that, right? Like, don't, don't, let's never say that again. Yeah, okay? I just, it, Maybe I, they I can delete this part from the podcast. I'm not doing the, what could happen three or four years down the line thing. Well, you, well, you're in a contract are. term, but you're in right now. You're in this but window. This is everyone the window keeps saying this, but yeah. like, what, what's your option for hardball with Matthews? What are you going to do? You're no, with Matthews, him? you're screwed. No, with Matthews, well, you yeah. just have so to plead like, to a what, sense of wanting to win a Stanley Cup. That's and it. They will. They will. But like, there's, there's no. The original sin here was not signing him for longer term. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, kudos to the agent for that deal that they got him. But if you go back and look at the story I wrote, it's like, why? Only giving him five years at the time was nuts. It was bad. Mm-hmm. It was bad. It was really bad. And I'm, then, and then, of course, Marner would only sign for six and then you're, you're here where we are right now, Mm -hmm. which is not great, which is really not great. The, the more you go over the, just the state of the Leafs right now, even heading into the draft last night where they had the one first round pick. Right. And I I wondered even if that played into the Easton Cowan pick is okay. So he has a second round draft grade, but guess what? Toronto doesn't have a second round pick. So that That was my thought too. Yeah. Like they, they couldn't like wait for the, so, I mean, obviously they like the kid and obviously they would have tried to trade back, but it's just such a weird night. There's like no trades. No one traded back. No one moved, even moved picks. When's the last time? Like, I think someone, I think someone said this is the first time since 07, since there wasn't a, a deal in the first round of the, of the draft. I don't know if they said that on a broadcast or whatever, but mm-hmm. that was something I heard on the draft floor yesterday. Yeah. I, I'll say this kind of to tie up the negotiation stock with those two guys. And then with Marner's. You're right. Okay. The original sin happened and we can't change the past when it comes to the length of those guys deals. But moving forward here, if you're Shanahan and you're tree living and you're hoping to retain your employment and actually make sure that the Leafs turn into a winner or try to build a winner around them. I I just, I have to think that there's, what was it? Was it cultural reset? Was that Masai's line? Was it a cultural reset? Yeah. It was Masai Ujiri's line. There has to be a bit of that in terms of what your priorities are. 
And if you're William Nylander and you're showing up and you're saying, yeah, I want to be in Toronto and yeah, I, I like it here and I want to win a Stanley Cup, but then I'm sitting down at the negotiating table going, yeah, but we're thinking about the salary cap three years from now and I, I don't want to end up looking like an idiot and take $9 million a year and I want more than Timo Meyer, who's signing right now then that to me is a pretty strong indicator as a group that you have to break up the comfortability at some point. And so, yeah, you're talking about, Hey, playing hardball. Okay. Maybe you aren't playing it with Matthews and that's a risk that he's going to have to take when it comes to his legacy in the city. I don't know how much he cares about that. Like who, what what is? what do we know that Austin Matthews cares about outside of fashion and making a ton of money? Like, I'm not really sure. I like, I don't know exactly like scoring goals. Um, I'd like a few more and some big moments, but well, yeah, I, I mean, think JD, he could pull a Dubois and just say, I want to be in LA or whatever. And then like, you know, he wants to be in Toronto. So yeah. like, at least you have a guy who's won the heart trophy recently. Who's, you know, world-class center. And like, he could, he could walk, you know? Yeah. I like, just he, don't understand can, the want to be in Toronto thing. It's like, why wouldn't someone want to be in Toronto? Like, you know, you're getting well, everything. Handed Arizona. To you. I mean, yeah. like, I remember when Matthews first got to Toronto and it was very clear that it was a, a new world to him. Like he, he came in and it was, it was, it was almost like bringing someone from, I, it was like bringing someone from like another continent or something. Well, like he was, he, just, he was in Zurich. He was, yeah, I know. But he, he seemed like someone who was like coming from a country that where guys don't normally come from to the NHL, to be honest, like it was very foreign to him and he had to adapt to that early on. And, he adapted and, and he, he loves it, but it could have went the other way. I mean, mm-hmm. it could have been a, a Kachuk situation where he's like, you know what? Like Canada is just too weird for me. And I don't know if I want to be here or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been seeing that in other places and I know Toronto's not Winnipeg, but Toronto's not Calgary. But I, I think that the fact that he wants to stay, I don't think he's going to take a contract. I think it's going to be more than McKinnon percentage wise on the cap and everything, but I don't think it's going to be a ruinous contract for this team. Mm-hmm. So it's not all doom and gloom with Matthews. He's going to stay. He's going to get a number that's not, that I don't think is going to be ridiculous, especially when you go forward two or three years into it. Mm -hmm. He potentially will sign five or six years as opposed to the three or four, which is what it seemed like earlier. I think all those things are wins for the Leafs. Yeah. Honestly, if you get six years that, that would change my perception on what the percentage is. Yeah. You're just like, yeah. Like if it's, I, I don't know what the number is going to be. I mean, my guess is the numbers is 14 something is probably my guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. Like I tell you. It just, again, it, it just, it's one of those things, James, where I, it's hard for me to go. Yeah. He wants to stay in Toronto or these guys want to stay in Toronto. What does that mean to me? That's like such an inferiority complex thing for the city that they just need to get over is it's yeah. Not, I guess though, what I would want to be around the league. Like sure. guys are leaving, right? Yeah, like, they are. Gotta, they yeah. are. But these these places, no offense to Winnipeg, you're not Toronto. Like you've been to Winnipeg. It's not doesn't resemble here, okay? Like it's better here, okay? Our air is bad now. We got the worst air. We're not doing well with our air. We're trying to I figure mean, it out. I'm here in Nashville, and there's a bunch of NHL guys here for the mm-hmm. awards. And like you know, you're like a twenty something, mm-hmm. and you look around here, and it's like. Why wouldn't you want to be here or why wouldn't you want to be in Vegas or, or South Florida? Because or... when you retire after a 40 year career in Nashville, you get a guitar that wasn't even owned by anybody famous. <laughs> like, that's why is that it's irrelevant. They're like, and Nashville has proven to be a hockey market. I'm like, yep. For the people that are in this building right now, uh, if Nashville was such a hockey town, I think they could have done better than the acts that were at the NHL awards after, you know, jelly roll came out for five seconds. It was like, who story, who, who is these people? Who are these people? Like, I I don't want to pretend like there's a few places where hockey matters to an extreme degree. And this is the thing with Matthews and this thing with Nylander. You guys are now on your next contracts. I do Uh, think that the priorities shift with guys to guys though. Like I I feel like this generation of players, it matters less. I mean, I, Mm. I know it matters to Matthews. I mean, I think that's part of this is like, he wants to be where, he likes being in the center of it all. And exactly. like, like I said, he was a fish out of water, but once he figured out what was going on and where he was, he's like, this is pretty cool. But that's why so, there has to be give back for this stuff, James. Like that's why there has to be some type of I mean, show. People could argue that that is give back like, uh. to, to, to give the years. I mean, it's going to be the rest of his prime, right? Like it's going to take him into his thirties. Like you're, you're getting like the, the whole entirety of his best years. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I I look at it and go, okay, you're going to matter here. You can be a huge sports celebrity 
if you end up actually winning a championship, which should be the goal for you, like I, I love that this is the idea. It's like, yeah, you know, the younger guys, I don't care about winning championships as much. It's like, cool. Why would we care about watching them? Like, why would people care about plunking down hard? What? I didn't say they don't care about winning. No, but it's just like the market stuff. It's like, okay, well, it shouldn't, it ties into the winning stuff. If you go yeah, like, oh, Kachuk I can win in Nashville. are going to have a better chance to win where they went. Uh, I guess it's hard to argue with the Kachuk thing, seeing that he just went to a Stanley Cup final. But yeah, that Every Flames team was pretty Winnipeg's good before they mess. blew it up. Like, you know, like it's not just about wanting to, it's, it's wanting to go where they can win and also going to, you know, a place where appeals to a 20 something year old millionaire. Mm. I would think you could have a lot of fun in Toronto as a 20 some millionaire. That's my guess from living here as not a millionaire who has quite a bit of fun in the city. (laughs) I would guess if you just said, Hey, punk, we're going to drop $10 million into your checking account. How's your life going to go? I'd be saying I could be all right here. I think I'll figure out how to have a decent time in Toronto. I just, yeah. It's also a fishbowl too, right? So like some guy, you get, you got to like want to be there, but like, look at like all the guys that want to be in Vegas or like, look Mm -hmm. at like, it's, I don't know. To me, there's, there's this like, weird shift happening where like the younger players want to be in some of these like Southern markets and there's the tax situation yeah. as well. And that's been talked. I mean, it was, I was talking with our Vegas writer, Jesse Granger about that. And like, it's just, you know, like Barbashev signs there and it's, he would have got more on the open market, but the tax situation is like, he actually does get more by staying in Vegas. Yeah. And there's, there's the talk around the league right now is that players just like, a lot of them want to be in these places, which is and if fine. they can win there, even better. Which is fine, um, except the thing is, we just saw Pierre Luc Dubois, who is I think Nylander's a better player than Pierre, like Pierre Luc Dubois. He is, and yeah, so he should get more than the eight five that he just got. But yeah, Pierre Luc Dubois is not going to a tax haven. That's he's going to L.A. He's going to get taxed uh, pretty severely living there, <laughs> and he's not going to have the post career thing living in Los Angeles where people go, oh, wow, you're going to, unless he wins multiple Stanley Cups, no one's going to know who he is. And same thing with Timo Meyer. He's in New Jersey. Guess where tax is also high? New Jersey. Guess what's not as nice of a city? New Jersey. Guess who hasn't won recently and where he has no uh, fealty to because he's been a part of that team for less than a season? Uh, New Jersey. So if you can't get your guys to kind of play ball to a certain degree, like a Nylander on a deal like that, if he's still worried about this, the, the cap going up thing, like, I think that that tells you that you do have a bit more of a problem than just purely, hey, it's good that these guys want to be back here. All right, let's shift to the camp thing, though, because this surprised a lot of people. And I was actually kind of surprised the other way because I thought that the rumors for camp was that he was actually going to have a pretty decent market if he hit it. He gets four years. What I didn't know is he had a no move clause. What 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 do you think happened here between the Leafs and camp where all of a sudden it went from, hey, this guy's absolutely a goner to this guy's a part of the roster again? Again, I'm speculating a little bit, but I think that the change in GM, I think the number moved a little bit and they got it done. Hmm. That, that's what I think happened. I mean, Jonas Siegel at, at our place has a story on it and kind of gets into some of that stuff. But um, I think that the Leafs felt like the number should be probably closer to two uh, in the camp, camp, <laughs> which sounds weird to say, the camp camp. Um, thought the number should be closer to three and there was they had some comparables and you know mm. um and i mean for agency is going to be just totally goofy this year so i mean th- there's probably a world where camp could get three on the open market you know there's gonna there's gonna be players who can't meaningfully contribute in the nhl who are going to get big money here on saturday mm-hmm. so i think what happened is they went I, I, my guess is keith really wanted camp back uh, Tree Living's decided Keefe's his guy, and they tried to find a compromise number, and that's what that number is. And it's a bit high for me, for sure, but there's going to be a whole bunch of high numbers going around. And I don't – also, I don't think I agree with – you know, it's, it's really the, the analytics group uh, on social media and, and in, in the media in general hated that contract, that camp mm-hmm. contract. I think they're underrating his contributions a little bit. I agree. Um. But I do also agree with the the notion that for the Leafs to get better and to be better in the playoffs, they probably shouldn't be playing camp 15 and a half minutes a game. So 
the concern with bringing him back at that number is there's going to he's going to be kind of like a crutch for Keith and he's going to get overplayed again. He's not going to generate offense. The Leafs aren't going to get enough offense from their bottom two lines. And I think that those are fair criticisms, especially when, you know, the rumors out there about who the Leafs are looking at in free agency. And it's like the, the big Coke machine guys that are going to be on the fourth line. Like, how are you going to build a lineup that's going to give you meaningful offense in the bottom six if camp is on your third line? And then Ryan Reeves or, or whatever's on your fourth line, like that feels problematic to me. Yeah, no, I agree. That's, that's the feeling I have with camp too. As I went, you know, 2.4, if we're talking about all this cap going up stuff, I feel mm-hmm. like this year, maybe it's a bit of a tougher squeeze, but moving forward that it ends up being fine. And if you have a checking line center, like David camp has played every single game the last two seasons for the Leafs. Hasn't missed the a guy's, game. The guy is in like, unbelievable condition he, like but he's like top like three percent in the nhl a hundred percent if you have seen david camp with his shirt off like i have <laughs> you would say yep where have you been hanging out are those some of the, like the fun places in toronto to no, go to that's where... <laughs> i wish i wish i saw it live and in person no it's uh, i've only seen it on instagram dude he's he's legitimately got well, he's like a crossfit fanatic yes, and no, I think his wife is too freak. and like he's yeah he's yeah. a freak he and it off- pays off on the ice. Like, he just doesn't get tired. Like, you watch him at the end of those, like, two-minute shifts yep. on the PK. Like, he's he's still ready to go. 100%. Like, he's a reliable guy in his own end. He doesn't make mistakes. Like, you look at his turnovers, and maybe you could argue that he doesn't have the puck enough where, you know, yeah, he can, or that's part of the offense is that he's not in that end, so he doesn't give it away. But, yeah, it, it doesn't turn the puck over, doesn't make a lot of mistakes, doesn't take penalties. Like, you know what you get in him, and what you get in him is a very good hockey player who, yeah, I think that you can rely upon. You're right, though. That's the other domino that sucks with the camp signing is you go, I like having him back. Actually, that number doesn't seem too bad. And then I look at things and I go, wait, no move clause? And then you say, well, how are you going to appreciably improve down the middle? Like, yeah. some people had fantasies about moving Tavares to the wing next year. That looks like... It's completely off well, the there's table. There's nothing at center and for no. agency. Like, no. what are you going to do? That's it. There, there's nothing there in the organization. You've got Pontus Holmberg, and that's not exactly appealing to me. Uh, I don't really want to see him playing those 15 minutes that you were talking about that Camp might be getting. It's just you're right. I don't. I don't know how they improve the offense unless. It's the back end, right? What do you? What are your thoughts on the the Carlson rumor? Because when I saw Toronto linked to his name, I, I like I got theories as to what that could be. But what do you think that conversation looks like? What's the beginning of that phone call? How much are you retaining? Okay, but <laughs> you know, and 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 what do you want? Well, what they I think, they I think want that's the beginning of the phone call. Like you retain half this deal because uh-huh. then it gets interesting. Yeah. Okay, but how does Toronto get that done then? That's the next question. I don't know. I mean, yeah. is, there, I is there any speculation out there with, well, I mean, uh, people are speculating Nylander, but like yeah. I, Nylander's worth more than, I mean, th- that Carlson contract, even with a lot retained, is going to be problematic at some point. Yeah, it is. It's going to be problematic at some point. And it's why, I, this is so funny right now with hockey deals is, like like Toronto's done nothing. They've won one playoff series. They won five games in the playoffs. And people are like, you can't trade any of these guys. There's just no player in the league for where there's a trade that makes any kind of sense for them. What do you like that trade? I don't like that trade, but I do like the idea of what the Leafs need to interject on is is Carlson with the Leafs need to interject on their team. I mean, it feels, I don't know. It feels Mm. like an odd fit. I wonder if that's just kicking tires and like seeing where the market's going to be. And People catch wind of it, and it's a good thing to put in the headline. I mean, I my guess is that the Leafs would not be near the top of the list of the suitors for Carlson, but, I mean, I guess we'll see. No, mine, t- mine too. Like, it, it's really hard to envision it happening. But if I'm just playing this out for fun, I, would, I think he's a better fit with the Leafs than it would appear on paper. Like, I, I don't think that there's a problem with ever adding a guy that that's that dynamite on offense, but also seems desperate to win right now. Like he's mm-hmm. not deciding to coast out his career in San Jose, right? No, he wants out yeah. because he wants to yeah. win somewhere. And well, so and he picked to go to San Jose and settled his family there. And like yeah. thought that was going to be a long-term destination for him. But part of the reason he thought that is because he thought they were going to be competitive. So you're right. Good on him for like seeing that's not the case and, and looking for another Avenue where he can win. So that's it to me as I go, okay, so Toronto's power play has been stagnant at times, weirdly for the amount of talent that they have. All of a sudden, maybe you add Carlson to that. 
Toronto has been weak on that side when it comes to puck movers and offensive guys for a bunch of years. Now you add Carlson to that side. You well, end the up. The D looked slow and one dimensional in the playoffs. Really. Exactly. Like, I mean, part of the reason they were getting hemmed was they just didn't have a lot of guys that could skate the puck. I mean, Riley, the, the Riley pairing was, it felt like all they had in a lot of those games against Tampa and Florida and exactly. Riley's the guy that can skate and move the puck. So when Luke Shen looks like one of your better puck moving D like you got, there's a problem there. And it's, it was interesting to me that tree living identified the blue line is where he wants to make a change. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it, the rumors out there was that the change he wanted to make was to get bigger and tougher on the back end. But and then all of a sudden Carlson's thrown into the mix. I mean, that is what's intriguing about it is that you could have Riley on one pair and you could have Carlson on another pair. I guess I mean you just I don't Carlson's like not he, the greatest defensive player, and neither is Morgan Riley. So I just wonder where that's going. So what? You just signed David Camp to four years. He better be the defensive player that you <laughs> have. You gonna play D? No, but <laughs> I, be like, <laughs> I, I don't think Toronto. It, it, you know, if I trust Sheldon Keefe for things, I think that he's done a good job as a head coach getting these guys to play defensive hockey, and I think that they've been responsible yep. that way. And to me, it's like the problem is clear: they don't score enough in the playoffs. And they haven't had reliable defensemen that they can throw up there in the playoffs. And so, yeah, do I think Eric Carlson um, is the best defensive player in hockey? No, I don't. And I was the, what year was the Ottawa run? 2017, 2018? It's a while ago now. Yeah. But it's, so it's been a minute since those, those guys made that run. Actually, it might've even been 2016. Um, Cause yeah, they lost to Pittsburgh and that was the year that Pittsburgh beat the Sharks, right? Anyway, um, sounds right. Yeah, I, that, I know Pittsburgh was here 2017 in the final against Nashville. Right. Yeah. So it, I think it was the year before, but either way, it was, was 2017. It, oh, it was 2017. 2017 okay. They yeah. lost so in the conference finals. 2017, they lose in the conference finals. But I remember Eric Carlson being the story of the playoffs up until that point. Like the guy mm-hmm. was diming oh, passes from his own 100%. end that were hitting guys in stride. Well, six years ago though, JD. Yeah, but it yeah. is six years ago, but he scored a hundred points last year. So it's not, yep. I, I don't think that he's completely washed up. Like he just stood at a podium accepting a Norris trophy award. And so, yep. yeah. Is there risk that comes with his contract for sure? But is there also tremendous upside? I would say yes. And so if you're the Leafs, I think that you have to look at this through either one of two avenues. One is that, how are you cobbling together pieces that work for the Sharks? Like, I don't think that Easton Cowan and Frazier Minton and, you know, a bunch of, like, I don't even know future picks. Like, you got to trade into, what, 2042 for the Leafs at this point? Like, I don't know if they have the assets to actually be able to get a deal done there where they're saying, yeah, take back, you know, TJ Brody and you can flip him for something or, like, I don't know how that part of it works. I feel as though maybe the the option there, if they really are thinking of something, is they go, you know what? we are the team actually that's going to want the plus back even on the retention. Like we'll give you Mitch Marner. We'll take back Carlson, but we want some goodies that are thrown in around this that are going to help us build out the rest of our roster. Well, in this, in fantasy land, they better move pretty quickly because Marner's no move clause comes on Saturday. Well, that's they're having the conversations right now. I do like this fantasy land though. It's a fun time. It's a fun time (laughs) for fantasy land stuff. Listen, I need fantasy land because reality land stinks. So I like, well, it's coming JD. I I mean, like our next conversation is going to be like, whoa, look at all this stuff that happened. Right. We're just, we're just waiting for it to happen. Yeah. So that doesn't intrigue you at all in fantasy land. Uh, Marner for Carlson does not. Yeah, no. of course. No, it's not going to be a straight up deal. I mean, you're you, clearly you, getting a player who's in his prime, but man, what a situation. About the Leafs needing offense. I mean, like you can, <laughs> I, I, the, the problem for me with moving Nylander or Marner is like, they're going to, they're going to have to bring back a pretty substantial offensive piece. And that does not exist in free agency. So mm-hmm. whatever deal you're making, you're going to have to replace that coming back the other way. If you mm-hmm. can. Ugh. All right. Well, we got to go. It's, this was great. See, your brain cells were fine. Sure. You were firing just yeah. fine. All it took was some, you know, hotter takes in the morning. Now you're ready. You don't even need coffee, James. You're fine. Just roll out onto the draft floor. Hopefully we see some trades today. And then, yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch up next week after hopefully they do something. Uh, I really, <laughs> I can't. Right. I, you, you had to talk me off the ledge in the text messages over the Kerfoot potential, but at least the camp signing. Hey, you want another spin for the <laughs> camp signing, Leafs fans? It definitely means Kerfoot's not coming back. They're not bringing both those guys back. Not both those guys getting paid by tree living. Anyways, James Riddle, senior managing editor at The Athletic. Uh, catch all his work there. Thanks for jumping on. I'll talk to you next week, man. All right. See, see you, buddy. buddy.